Good morning, everyone. We have Mary Popeo with us today, and she's going to be talking about the Peace Culture Village tours of Peace Park, which they're just starting to launch this month. And uh, thank you so much for joining us, Mary. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to to finally be, uh, you know, on this show. I've been watching some of the um, some of the past ones, and oh, think awesome. you're doing really, really great work. Thank you so much. Uh, do you want to start by just introducing yourself a little bit? Yeah, of course. So my name is Mary, as Joy said, um, and I'm a staff member at Peace Culture Village, which I'm sure we'll get into later. But it's a nonprofit here in Hiroshima, and we do um, work in the peace education realm. Um, and I'm originally from Boston in the United States, and I moved to Hiroshima four years ago uh, to found this nonprofit with some other members. And yeah, wonderful to be here. That's great. <laughs> so you're the business director at Peace Culture Village. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, it's funny. The titles don't really mean anything, to be honest. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, we all do a lot of things. So, uh, but yeah, that is my official title. Yeah. <laughs> And it says you like video games. What's your favorite video game? Oh, so hard to choose. Is it hard? Uh, <laughs> it's really hard. Yeah, I would say like um, video games is probably the original reason why I got interested in Japan and Japanese culture. Um, is that it's right? a big part. It's a big part of my my childhood and also a big um, later we'll talk about things in the future future dreams, but I kind of really am hoping someday to use gaming and game technology in peace culture education. Um, I think there's a lot of really interesting things that could be done in that area. But as far as favorite game, probably Super Smash Brothers Ultimate is the game I'm the biggest into right now. It's a fighting game. Awesome. Because this is also streaming on Twitch, the gaming oh, platform. Yeah. So thank you for talking about your favorite game. Yeah. If you're listening on Twitch, comment and, and yeah, tell us that you're there. Connect. Let's connect. Um, yeah, so I thought that was that was fine. And you mentioned uh, connecting peace with video games, which we'll talk about a bit later because you guys are kind of doing that. It's not a video game, but it is using augmented reality. Yes. So, so that's I'm very, very excited exciting. about that project. <laughs> yeah. So before we go into that, uh, let's talk a little bit about how you came to Japan and your peace activism. Sure. Uh, you mentioned in another talk to students at Boston um, mm -hmm. about the activism that you were doing and that brought you to Japan. Could you just introduce that to us a little bit? Yes, of course. So uh, I studied um, international relations and East Asian studies at Boston College. And as a sophomore, well, at, at BC, there are lots of really awesome opportunities for students and resources. Um, and so I was able to, uh, as a sophomore in college, go to, um, to Nagasaki uh, for the summer to study hidden Christian history. So I'm a Catholic woman and my original motivation to travel to Japan was to study the history of uh, the Christians that had been persecuted in Nagasaki. Um, and up until that point, I had actually never learned about the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in school. So I was very, very shocked um, to learn what I learned from listening to bomb survivor or hibakusha testimonies, um, visiting the museum there, seeing the A-bombed rosaries and the A-bombed statue of Mother Mary. And I was very angry. Um, I thought, you know, it, I think the hidden Christian community in Nagasaki at that time was probably the largest community of Christians in East Asia. And I just could not understand uh, how... America had bombed them after their long history of persecution. So um, that became kind of like an event that really changed my life. And um, after that summer, I continued to come back to Hiroshima and Nagasaki every summer, uh, as you said before, doing this um, nuclear weapons abolition activism with um, different groups in Boston, uh, in DC, in Japan. Um, and now I live here and kind of do work related to that. So it was a really, really life changing summer. Um, yeah. And as one of one of the things I heard you mention was Gensuikyo, a march. Can you tell yeah. us about that? I'd never heard of that. 
Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. I love talking about it. So this is also a hugely uh, impactful experience for me. But Gensuikyo, the Japan Council Against A&H Bombs, um, works with some different partner organizations to organize a peace march every year. It's been going on for quite some time, and it's a 90-day march from Tokyo to Hiroshima, although there's many different routes. Um, and so I was able to participate um, with the help and funding of the Women's Peace Fund and um, New, New Japan Women's Association um, in 2015 as an international youth relay marcher. So they have um, every part of the march will have a different youth relay marcher from a different country or different area. Um, and so I marched from Okayama to Hiroshima, the last leg of the relay in, uh, that year. And it was... Um, I would say, um, and, and, and e even every year now, uh, Gensikyo, of course, organizes the, the World Conference. Um, I forget the full name, but the World Conference is probably, you know, I don't want to misspeak, but I believe it's the largest conference, civilian-led conference on um, nuclear weapons issues in the world. Um, and I've been, again, attending that every year for a while. And I feel like um, the the folks that I met during that march really ultimately kind of convinced me to move here. Um, and especially, you know, I, most of the folks are older folks, although there are some young folks, but I would say just having those mentors and um, feeling supported and encouraged by um, not, not only those um, amazing activists, but also the people in Boston who put me in touch with those activists um, there's really a great community of people doing this work. And whenever I hear about the Peace March, I always get so happy and nostalgic because I really owe a lot to those people. That's wonderful. And you, in the other interview, you're talking about uh, it's a great way to meet other international activists who came and, and joined that yeah. march. Um, you also mm -hmm. mentioned Global Zero. Mm -hmm. Yes. Can you introduce so, that? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So in Boston, actually, I um, at the World Conference when I was in Hiroshima one year, I met a man named Joseph Gerson, and he at the time was working for the American Friends Service Committee, and he happened to be from Boston. And so the way I actually first got into activism was through Joseph and the American Friends Service Committee doing um, volunteering with them. And then, um, you know, that was kind of my gateway, I guess. And then um, I also, when I, after, or during and after college, was involved with this organization called Global Zero. Again, um, hugely, I cannot, like, express the amount of experiences and knowledge that I gained. Work. Like, Global Zero had this um, program called the Action Core program, where um, I think there was one young person from each state that was doing Global Zero's youth organizing there. But we were also supported by field organizers. We would have weekly calls. We got toolkits um, with talking points and information about nuclear weapons. Um, every year, they would fly us, not fly us, they would, they would bring us all together to D.C. or New York, where we would have lobbying weekends. And there were also members from India and Pakistan. So um, that was amazing that uh, Global Zero expended that amount of resources into training. Um, you know, uh, youth activists and youth organizers. So I also really cannot understate um, how impactful working with Global Zero was to my development as well. That's awesome. And you also mm -hmm. mentioned you did a program at the United Nations. Yeah, so it's a little fuzzy to be honest, but um, there, so with the American Friends Service Committee and other organizations, they planned this conference called Peace and Planet uh, for the 2000, I want to say 15 N NPT, so the Nuclear um, Non-Proliferation Treaty, gosh, I'm blanking on the name, the NPT, they have a, pr uh, like a, it's reviewed every 10 years, but so on in 2015, there was a preparatory committee that was pretty large with a big rally. And so at the United Nations, of course, all of the, um, the important, you know, yeah, you, high level folks are meeting. But then the, the, the thing that I, I really wanted you to explain, which I thought was really exciting. You were talking about, um, part of the activities was being a lobbyist. Oh, okay. Okay. Yep. 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 
So, I mean, with Global Zero, we would do things like collect petition signatures, collect postcards, and deliver them to our local representatives. For example, um, Ed Markey and Elizabeth Warren at the time, I'm from Boston, so those are my senators. Um, or um, going, for example, we would all get together in D.C. and, um, you know, go uh, meet with different uh, officials. Or in New York at the U.N., what we did was with um, actually, I think, like, embassies. I'm trying mm -hmm. to remember. Like, I yeah, know we went in, to in the Iranian interview, you embassy. say, yeah, embassies, and uh, you talk to politicians. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, yep. And so, so, um, so important yeah. to get have lobbyists uh, talking about nuclear issues or sustainability issues, as well as you know lobbyists from companies and stuff trying to get easier restrictions on their products, right? Oh yeah, definitely. And I think it was a great opportunity for me to learn that in a democracy, we like Americans have the right to do that. Um, you know, I think sometimes for me, politicians and elected officials can seem quite distant. But, um, you know, I was really surprised and excited um, that to have those opportunities um, to talk to our elected officials about what we cared about. And then we would also do like um, for the, for example, the election, the 2016 presidential election. Before that, we would go bird dogging. So actually go to these rallies and then ask questions related to nuclear weapons so we could get the candidates on the record saying something about the issue because it's not an issue that people talk about a lot. Um, and that was also kind of crazy. Um, like we met Carly Fiorina um, at a rally uh, near Boston. And, uh, you know, I don't know. I just never thought I would connect <laughs> with um Yeah, with wild. Like that, so. Yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's shift gears a little bit, talk more about what you're doing now with Peace Culture Village. Can you introduce the, comp the organization and basically what you guys do? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so Peace Culture Village, we are a local bilingual team of um, foreigners and Japanese folks who um, we've dedicated our careers to learning about and practicing Hiroshima peace education. Um, and concretely what that means is mostly we are, make, we are creating um, peace education programs for folks that visit Hiroshima looking to learn about what happened here um, or about peace in general. Um, and the word peace culture is actually kind of key. Um, this phrase I believe was coined in Hiroshima here in Hiroshima, uh, we have the Peace Culture Foundation, which is the organization that kind of runs the Peace Museum. Um, and the founder of Peace Culture Village, Stephen Leeper, is the former chairman of uh, that organization. And when he was chairman, he would get asked a lot by people, what is peace culture? And he found that he not only had trouble answering that, but also that there's not a lot of discussion here in Hiroshima um, about what peace culture is. Um, I think um, the stories of the Hibakusha the bomb survivors and of course the history of what happened here to me is utterly convincing um, in terms of war, war is terrible, nuclear war is terrible, nuclear weapons should be eliminated. But then how do you move forward from that? How do you concretely change people's hearts, minds, our political socioeconomic systems so that um, our communities are healthy and we have a peach culture? So that's kind of the origin of Peace Culture Village, why we exist to explore that um, with people from around the world uh, with the foundation of um, what happened here in Hiroshima. Yeah, great. Um, on screen right now, I have Stephen Leeper doing lectures, mm -hmm. lectures and webinars, which I, I know that you do as well. Um, and then the Peace Portal and then the Peace Dialogue. Do you want to start with the lectures and webinars that you've been involved with? Yeah, sure. So this is our new website that you're looking at. So, um, you know, PCV has existed for four, three or four years now. Um, and we, are, again, like originally started as actually an eco village and have evolved into this kind of broader peace education nonprofit. But um, essentially the lectures and webinars are, um, so Steve, our daihyo, our, I don't know, Leader, founder, founder. Let's yeah, call him founder. <laughs> Our founder. <laughs> he um, has been in Hiroshima for half of his life. He has a lot to, um, I think, a lot to say and a lot of important um, 
important things to um, to discuss with people. Um, and so our lectures and webinars are mainly kind of Steve's domain. He um, often will get asked to speak at schools or for organizations. And now um, with coronavirus, a lot of those are becoming webinars. Um, so basically, um, it, like on the website, on that page, we have Steve's biography and everything. But um, the things that he generally talks about are like um, Japan's role in eliminating nuclear weapons and with the ban treaty um, or what is peace culture and how do we get there or, um, you know, um, also like sustainability as well. So, um, you know, Steve right now is living at the eco village we have up in Miyoshi. So that's an issue we all really care about, too. Nice. And the peace portal. Tell us about it. Yes, so this is the, uh, the the project you were talking about earlier that I'm really excited about. Um, so the Peace Portal is basically um, a catch-all term for PCV's online program. So that includes Steve's webinars. It also includes, um, so this project we're working on with an American company called Time Looper based in New York. And Time Looper, you can download uh, their app and look them up. Uh, they basically create AR and VR experiences of um, museums, national parks. Um, they create ways for us to, um, I mean, now with, they've been doing this long before coronavirus, but ways for us to access all of these places. Um, and so we're working with Time Looper to create an AR app of Hiroshima Peace Park um, that will be, you'll be able to uh, self-guide yourself in the park. Um, and guided by PCV staff with, um, um, you know, uh, materials from Hiroshima. And so we're also hoping that this app, which will be free on the App Store, hopefully by the end of the month, um, will um, be useful to teachers in classroom settings as well. So I think, um, especially here in Japan, school field trips uh, have been canceled. And in America, um, the I guess, research that Time Looper did shows that teachers are three times more likely to want to do a virtual field trip this year than last year. And coming from a peace education perspective, we really feel that because people are isolate, you know, having to isolate more and more because of the virus, um, it's really important now to, um, to think with students about the meaning of peace culture um, in this new kind of moment we're experiencing. Um, and so that is one project we're working on. Another uh, kind of similar uh, thing that we're doing is called Peace Park Tour Online. And that is a, um, a program using Google Earth technology um, where um, PCV facilitators will basically guide a group through the park using Google Earth. And something really important to that program and kind of a staple of PCV is output. So when a lot of people come to Hiroshima, they see what happened here and they think that was terrible and that's kind of the end of the conversation. Um, but I think it's also really important um, for people to be able to digest and maybe process those feelings, uh, whether verbally or, or through reflection, and then also kind of connecting that to our present and future. So uh, how does this relate to my life today? Uh, you know, what what is the future I envision and maybe what could my role be in, in realizing that future? So really mm -hmm. personalizing it. I think Peace Park Tour Online uh, prioritizes that. Yeah, really interesting. And I see on the the screenshot of the Peace Portal, you have Mayu Seto and she's our guest on Friday. Yay! Yeah. Great. <laughs> yes. So um, she um, is actually... Uh, you know, an, an amazing, wonderful um, a person that is guiding with us um, at the Rust House. Um, and so, yeah. Yeah, are, wonderful. So just to give people a, an idea, um, looking at the images right now, we can see the building that was before what is now the A-bomb dome. Yes. Ruiz, the right? Hiroshima Industrial Promotion Hall. Yeah, it has a very long name. Yep. <laughs> um, it was it was basically a kind of office building, as far as I can tell, right? And then oh, yeah, it, it, was it was the for displaying yeah. Hiroshima's local products. Mm -hmm. And then there was also lots of concerts, events, exhibits. 
Yeah, that's very exciting. So you're doing the online tours. Let's talk more about the in-person tours because, of course, they'll be connected to the online tours. Mm -hmm. um, can you give us a, an orientation of how you do the tour? I've got a map I can show here. Go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. So um, PCV works with a group called uh, Hiroshima Chugoku Shimbun Travel. And they are kind of running the Rust House, which is a building that survived the atomic bombing in the center of Peace Park. And so st we've been working on developing this tour for half a year now, but we just started um, giving the tours this July. And so basically the, the distinguishing features of our tour, I would say, are that we focus quite heavily on the people who are living in Nakajima district in Hiroshima at the time, which is what became Peace Park. Um, and it was one of the closest neighborhoods to the hypo center. And the reason we do that is to really familiarize people with what was lost, um, because you can't tell by visiting Peace Park what was there. Um, and I think focusing on the lives of the people that were there who were leading lives very similar to maybe the lives we leave today really helps people make that personal connection. Um, another thing that we do is we um, like to use technology to, to convey that. So for example, um, we are working with Fukuyama Technical High School. Um, the students and teachers there have created this incredible VR world of Nakajima. Um, and the purpose of it was so that survivors could actually revisit Nakajima before um, the atomic bombing. And so it's very, very accurate because survivors will point out, ah, this was a little bit more rusted and things like that. And so we're using um, CG images from their VR world. And we're also collaborating with Kyoku no Kaito, Rebooting Memories, which is a project led by um, Hidenori Watanabe from Tokyo University and Niwata Anju-san, who uh, is from Hiroshima, but now a student uh, in Tokyo. And they're creating uh, they're taking black and white images from the day and colorizing them using AI technology. So with these types of materials, we think that it can really help bring Hiroshima to life and help us realize that it's not some old history. It's very connected to our lives today. And then finally, as we talked about before, um, our tours really focus on output and reflection. So at several t uh, spots throughout the tour, we invite people to participate in activities that will help them digest what they're experiencing um, and then after the tour is over, we have a 20 minute output session at the rest house where we participate in, again, an activity um, called the River of Hope, where people basically create a collective art piece on the wall um, together with Hibaksha uh, survivors and other participants of the tour. So um, it's a little bit about what we're doing. Yeah, uh, talk a little bit. I've got the picture now of the River of Hope. Mm -hmm. um, so what's the concept that people write there? Yeah. So um, basically, the last thing we talk about on our tour is the lantern floating ceremony that's held on August 6th every year in Hiroshima, that people write, they dedicate their lanterns to their loved ones who passed away, or they write their wishes for hope and float them down the river. And so our river of hope um, Basically, after the tour is over, everyone sits down and, you know, we talk about how the people of Nakajima thought their lives were going to continue how they always had. And they lost everything to the bomb and to the war. They lost their families and their jobs and their hobbies and their neighborhood. Um, and so for me, that always makes me think about what I really cherish and treasure and love in my life. And so that's kind of the theme of what people write about and they can draw, they can write, they can use their post-it however is most helpful for them to process. Um, and then afterwards they can share about that if they'd like or they don't have to um, and everyone posts them on the wall. So the post-its that the participants write on are blue. So they make up the river. And then the post-its that are colored represent the lanterns, and they're written by bomb survivors. Um, and we've laminated them so that we can keep them, and we're hoping to slowly collect more of them. So eventually, once this river is full of blue post-its, we'll kind of be um, carrying these Hibaksha stories, just like how the next generation will um, you know, carry on their stories to, to people from now on. So that's kind of the idea behind it. Yeah, nice. I like that idea. It's a great way to document the legacy of Hiroshima through storytelling. 
Yeah. Um, are you going to put them into a book or how are you preserving the yeah. stories? So for the Hibaksha post-its, we've laminated them and we plan to just uh, keep using them. For the participant post-its, originally we were worried, that, I mean, this is seeking sustainability, right? It's not very sustainable. And we were hoping that we could make the post-its out of um, like orizuru, out of paper cranes, but that ended up being too expensive. So what we settled on is there's a tradition in Japanese culture called tondo matsuri. Um, and it's basically a bonfire that is held around the new year um, where people write their wishes on paper and then attach them to the bamboo. And then in the bonfire, they are symbolically lifted up to heaven. So we're thinking that every once in a while, we will bring all of those um, post-its out to the village in Miyoshi and have a tondo matsuri and then film that and put it online so people can see that you know, um, all of their, the things that they cherish and love, um, are kind of going up to, you know, whatever you believe in the force mm -hmm. or uh, connecting with everyone. So that's the plan for those. Yeah. Um, can I just make two comments on that? <laughs> So if, if possible, if you could think about using recycled paper um, mm -hmm. as the post-its, uh, mm -hmm. you could use recycled paper, which comes from Orizuru, which is sold in the Peace Park. I know that's a little bit more expensive, but mm -hmm. um, you could maybe do a collaboration with one of the companies, which is making recycled paper postcards and other mm -hmm. things from the Orizuru which is donated in the tens of thousands to Hiroshima City every year, and they mm -hmm. can't keep all of them. So it's one way to have a circular economy mm -hmm. and reuse and recycle the, mm -hmm. the wishes that people send because Orizuru is a, a wish and hope for peace, right? So if so, if having some people way, write on the post-its and then recycling those post-its. Well, using the recycled Orizuru paper Mm -hmm. which some companies in Hiroshima are doing as mm -hmm. the post-it yeah, okay. at first and mm -hmm. then taking photos of it. So you've got a digital log, digital mm -hmm. album somewhere. So it's always preserved. And then recycling that paper. I know that the idea of, of burning it is a, is a ritual and everything, but if it could be reused in some way or maybe at the Peace Color Culture Village, you could use that paper once the use has been spent to make washi paper. Mm. If it comes from the Orizuru paper and it's recycled paper and then you recycle it into new washi paper, you could use it on your shoji at the Peace Color Culture Village. You could mm. use it for new projects with students when you're making posters. So the idea of uh, having a circular closed loop of mm -hmm, resources mm -hmm. is always the goal for a sustainability. Mm -hmm. Whether it's possible or not, um, the idea is at least think about it and consider it. And then if it's not possible now, just put a pin in it, try it in the future, right? I mean, that's, that's the idea. Sustainability is everywhere. So there's always something you can think about how to improve on that. But yeah, I, I love the... Suggestion. I love the I concept of it. I'm taking notes and I'll okay. talk to everyone about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about the rest house. What an amazing building. Mm, yes. Um, so the rest house, it's been under construction for, I think, the past two years. Um, and something really special or, I guess, something to know about the rest house is that there were 37 people working there. Um at the time of the bombing and only one of them survived um, for a long period of time. His name was Eizo Nomura and the reason he survived was because he was in the basement of the building looking for a document when the bomb exploded. Um, and so the rest house has been renovated and um, you know, there are certain places in the rest house that have been preserved. Um, so when you're walking around the rest house, you'll see like encased areas with plaques that will explain like, oh, this section of the ceiling is original. This um, part of the ceiling here is original. And this wall, like certain parts of the wall on the outside of the building are original. And then the basement has also been left 
intact, although they have made it more accessible. So um, you used to have to wear a helmet when you went down there. Um, there was also no elevator and the floor is was quite deco boco, like uneven. uneven. Mm -hmm. Um, and so now they kind of put a new floor in that can be taken up, but they put a new floor in and an elevator and you don't have to wear a helmet, so it's much more accessible. And then on the third floor, there is a great exhibit um, about Nakajima District, again, like what used to be Peace Park. Um, and so I would highly encourage everyone to go visit. Um, and yeah, I think um, it's very worthwhile. Yeah, it's a beautiful remodel, renovation, and it's so wonderful to see that they preserve the building, the original building. Um, even for the A-bomb dome, there was talk about pulling it down, right, and not keeping it as is. So mm -hmm. having the original building um, for, it used to be a tea house? Or it was originally a kimono shop. Kimono shop, right? And having that original building as mm -hmm. the main information center and remodeling it so it's nice and comfortable inside um, mm -hmm. makes such a difference. And it, it, yeah. it has that tangible connection to history, the yeah. tangible connection to what happened here. And it, I, I think there is a good argument for keeping some of the original structures, don't you? Yes, absolutely. I mean, to my knowledge... The rest house and the atomic bomb dome are the two structures in the park left from Nakajima. Um, and then there's also a place in the park you can see the original ground level of Nakajima. Um, but yeah, definitely. Like I think, for example, in Nagasaki, and I know they had reasons for doing this, but um, Urakami Cathedral, the ruins of it were replaced with what's now the new Urakami Cathedral. Um, and so I always am really um, grateful that the atomic bomb dome is still here as a witness to what happened. Definitely. Yeah, I, I find it really powerful. You know, I mean, I, I also visited Nagasaki. You know Nagasaki very well. Um, I was surprised that there aren't any original structures really preserved mm. like everything it's powerful to be at the museum and and the Peace Park, but everything is pretty much new. It's, mm, mm, mm. you know, there are parts of things, but one, one original structure which they did keep, which I found really powerful, is the half Tori gate. Do I don't think I've seen that yet. Really? There's a shrine, yeah. or yeah, it should be shrine because it has a Tori, right? Mm -hmm. um, and only half of it was left standing in Nagasaki. And mm. behind that Tori gate was the temple, which was dis the shrine, which was destroyed, but also two beautiful big ginkgo trees, I believe, and they were destroyed, but they grew back. Wow. So beautiful twin trees and, you know, the big straw rope between them mm. and this half Tori gates still standing, mm. you know, so it, it is so powerful. If you visit Nagasaki, you definitely have to. Yeah, I haven't been in so long. Out. Yeah. Uh, when you were in Nagasaki, you were there as an activist, right? Well, I was actually there as a, as a person who had never heard of what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So <laughs> okay. the first, I mean, the first time I went there, I was just there to study the, the Christian aspect. And I returned once or twice, um, through um, this program called the Oleander Initiative, which PCV or um, helps, um, there's an organization in the U.S. called University of the Middle East Project, and they bring teachers to Hiroshima from the Middle East, South Korea, and the United States and other countries every year. Um, so we went there with the teachers to help with logistics and things. But I haven't, since 2012, really been back there for my own like yeah. time. I, so, I went a few years ago and I was thinking of, of doing a trip to go on Peace Day this year. But with coronavirus, it's, it's tricky. But I, I, might, I might drive down there, take a drive and, and take. I've never been there for their Peace Memorial Day. Mm -hmm. And this is 75 years. This is a very special year. Yeah. Um, let's go back to the rest house. I've got a mm -hmm. picture of the downstairs gift shop. Can you describe mm -hmm. what kinds of things are in the souvenir shop or gift shop? Sure. So as you were saying, there's a lot of that things made of orizuru, so postcards, notebooks. Um, there's orizuru earrings. Um, 
my favorite thing is, of course, the food. So um, they have like Hiroshima is really famous for um, like citrus fruits. And so they have a lot of things related to that. Also, lots of local products um, like jams from Osaki Kamijima or things like that. Um, and something really cool that I just saw yesterday for the first time is they have these like they're selling these models that you can create of the rest house in three different iterations of it. So like um, how it looked before the bombing when it was still the kimono store, how it looked before its recent restoration and how it looks now. And so for me, I was they have them on the front desk and I was studying them because it's really interesting to see how the building has changed. Yeah, interesting. Um, mm -hmm. We got a comment. Keiko Arita says, Joy, your suggestion of recycling of origami is awesome. I was thinking of that in the same way. Thank you, mm. Keiko, for commenting. I know it's hard. No, trust me, I know it's hard. And I know there's loads of committees to involve the, any kind of change. But mm -hmm. I would suggest just talking about it, just thinking about it. Is it possible? If it's possible, try it. Yeah, you, because um, especially for Peace Park, anything that you guys do in Peace Park, you're being watched very closely. And we know that international visitors, especially, which is a big uh, aim of any, but any international visitor living or visiting Japan, coming to Peace Park, they really want to go to Peace Park Museum. They really want to spend time there. That's one of the top aims. We know that, right? Mm -hmm. um, we also know that 80% of all travelers around the world are looking for sustainable options and mm -hmm. sustainable products when they travel. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it seems perfect in Peace Park to be thinking about how can we improve our brand of the Peace Park by having a sustainable product, by having sustainable services, mm -hmm. by thinking about everything that we're doing and could we do it better? And if we are being great examples, the visitor notices, they really notice, you know? So if, for example, I know they have a cafe on the third floor. Second. Yes. Oh, second floor. Yeah, it looks mm -hmm. like a great cafe. I want to talk more about the cafe design and everything in a second. But like all cafes in Japan right now, all of the coffee is served in disposable single-use containers. Mm -hmm. And I understand that is a coronavirus reality right now, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But is there any way that maybe one of the snacks could be in a display case and go on a plate which is reused, right? Mm -hmm. Is there any way that you could ask people, do you need a lid? And if they don't need a lid, you're saving a little bit of plastic, right? So mm -hmm. just thinking about how could we make this a little bit more sustainable? Of course, the best would be reusable cups. Mm -hmm. But I know during coronavirus, this is really tricky right now. Starbucks has stopped reusable cups. You can't even use your own travel mug at Starbucks. Mm. So I know a lot of coffee shops are struggling with this, but I think um, especially in Peace Park, I am a bit urusai about this. I'm so sorry because I'm from Hiroshima. No, 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 no problem. <laughs> but um, it's the Hiroshima brand is peace. Mm. And peace is so connected to sustainability because we have wars because of oil. We are having immigrants who have to leave their countries because of climate change. So that also creates war or unpeaceful situations around the world. Um, so we, if we think about it and try to be as good as we can, that's a great brand for Hiroshima, especially in Peace Park, right? No, I completely agree with you. And I think that's something that PCV very, very much um, is one of our values as well, sustainability and um, in all of the facets of, of that word, community sustainability, environmental sustainability. Um, so thank you all so much for the great suggestions. We of course did talk about, um, you know, doing the post-its with the Orizuru material. The issue that we ran into was the cost associated with it. 
So I think it's definitely something that we can revisit. And now that you are all bringing this to my attention, I think um, it's definitely something I'll bring up with the team and hopefully maybe we can brainstorm a creative way to, uh, to make it work. Awesome. Um, it's all just about bringing it up, talking about it, talking about possibilities and bringing it up again. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and one other great thing about Peace Park, when next time you make the map, um, you should maybe also think about putting where the water fountains are because uh, Peace Park actually has a lot of water fountains. And if people have their own reusable water bottles, um, mm -hmm. like My Mizu, the My Mizu app, you can use anywhere. Um, mm -hmm. But on your map as well, if you just mark where the water fountains are, I, I was searching around for water fountains. There's a great cool one it keeps the water cool in the museum. Mm -hmm. And when I was putting that on the My Mizu app and talking to some visitors, they were refilling their pet bottle and they said, you know, we don't have our own container, but we usually buy one pet bottle and then we just try to refill it. So that, that's better than keep buying pet bottles over and over, right? Mm -hmm. um, but they were saying it's really hard to find water fountains. Mm -hmm. So that's why the My Mizu app is so useful, but also if you have it on your map and encourage people, especially as it gets hot now, mm -hmm. to refill their own bottles, um, that's another way to reduce waste, right? Yeah, great. No, I'm, I'm taking so many notes. Thank okay, you. Good, I know good, good. this is an opportunity to talk about what I do, but I think it's also a great opportunity for me to, you know, you're an expert in, in sustainability in Hiroshima, so... I'm well, very grateful too to get all these awesome suggestions. I am so supportive of everything that you guys are doing. And I know it's so hard to see everything, you know? It's, uh, I was talking to Ian Shimizu the other day of We Mori. He's creating an app to help people plant trees around the world. <laughs> and uh, he said, in, there's an expression in Japanese, which of course we have the same expression in English. It's difficult to see the forest for the trees. Right. When you're right up against something, it's hard to see the big picture. You can only mm -hmm. see what's in front of you. And so if I can, you know, be a little Udusai and you guys can put up with it and take the suggestions. I'm really I'm so yeah. happy. Yeah, don't. Of course, of course. And if no, it can't be done, I get Udusai, it. It's it's <laughs> it's an important issue that we should speak out about. And I think people who care about peace in Hiroshima um, absolutely should, should talk about this. So I'm really grateful for your suggestions. So okay. no, no Urusai. <laughs> well, I, I want to come and take your tour yeah. and, and I haven't been back to the, the tea house, the kimono house since it's mm -hmm. been reopened. So I definitely want to come and check it out. Yeah. Um, I'm so excited that you guys are doing the tours. It's, it's such a great way to introduce to a wider audience, especially now that you're doing it online, people that mm -hmm. can't come to Hiroshima for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. And this year, the 75th is such a big draw that people want to be here and yes. want to participate, but it's just not possible right now. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk a little bit about the different points on the tour. So mm -hmm. what kinds of things you talk about at the Cenotaph, at the A-Bom uh, ruins, Mm -hmm. and at the Children's Monument of Sadako. Can you walk us sure. through? Tell us a little bit about the kinds of things she talks about at each part of the key points of the tour. Thank you again, Mary, for joining us again. Yeah, thanks for having me. <laughs> Sorry about I that. Yeah, with technology, we've been oh. doing, again, these online tours, and it's always so stressful trying to make sure all the technology is figured out. Oh, my um, gosh, yeah. But, yeah, so for the tour, for example, we go, um, when we talk about, so, oh, yeah, so I was saying, when we are creating the tour, PCV is mainly a peace education nonprofit and not a tourism nonprofit, although we kind of do both. So when we were developing this tour, we were trying to think about how to give tourists what they want as far as foundational information about what happened in Hiroshima while also providing that little extra bit of like peace education content. So, um, for example, at the Atomic Bomb Dome, we talk about um, things like why it's still standing, how, like you said before, it took 20 years for the city to decide to keep it. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's the most famous, iconic symbol of Hiroshima and the devastation of nuclear weapons. But we also um, invite people at the A-Bomb Dome to participate in a reflection activity with us um, that kind of helps people to imagine um, 
you know, what was happening, where they were standing on the day of August 6th at 8.15 or 8 15 a.m. Uh, and then we kind of invite people to imagine what they're doing on a Monday morning because it was a Monday morning. Um, and so trying to, again, like give people a chance to stop and think or not think, just take in what um, they're learning and hearing. Um, and then we also, of course, um, use these um, these images created by the um, rebooting memories team. Um, so we have some interesting images taken near the A-bomb dome that have been colorized using AI technology that we think really help people, again, to connect with what was the Peace Park before the bombing. Um, and then at the Cenotaph, um, again, similar thing. We give people the information that they might hear on any tour, um, what the Cenotaph is, what's inside the ceremonial um, stone coffin underneath it. We talk about, um, you know, um, what this place was like before the bombing. And then finally, we have a reflection. Um, so at the main monuments in the park, that's kind of the flow of yeah. station. I'm showing the map right now. And uh, so from the Cenotaph and the museum, the Cenotaph, the Children's Monument, the A-Bomb Dome, they are all in a line for anyone who hasn't visited Peace Park. And they were designed that way. The Peace Park was designed to give you this view from the museum through the monuments so you can see all aspects. And uh, I went to Orizuru Tower, which you can see beyond the Ebom Dome. And they were saying how they are happy to be in the line of sight as well as another part of the peace experience, which they are hoping to extend every few years. So they have a, a new monument along the way, farther mm. and farther away from the Peace Park. And I, I thought that was such an interesting story. So when I, I do guide training through Peace Park and, and uh, that's one of the stories that, that I tell and please take it on if you like that one. <laughs> we also talk about that too. So uh -huh. a man named Kenzo Tange, mm -hmm. um, he designed that line. He won like an international competition to, to do it that way. And I've also heard that like um, Green Arena is on the line. Mm -hmm. Motomachi Elementary School is on the line, which was a, an, a school that was heavily affected by the atomic bombing. So yeah, the line, as you were saying, it's not only important to Peace Park, but it extends far beyond the park um, and is an important architectural element of mm -hmm. the city. And I always uh, say thank you and appreciate all the city planners and the designer like Tange-san mm -hmm. um, because our Peace Park is so green and has so much natural beauty as a way to help people recover from the trauma of thinking about the bomb, but also giving hope for the future. And it's one of the most beautifully designed uh, peace parks in the world, I think, of, mm -hmm. of any that I visited. And I often hear that from visitors, that that connection to nature with the rivers and the trees and the monuments um, is such a, a beautiful design. And so that's also a big part of sustainability is planning, mm. right? Sustainable develop really needs good planning and design it's all really important aspects of it mm -hmm. absolutely yeah yes and you also go to the children's monument do you want to introduce that a little bit sure so um there's often um even foreigners have heard of sadako sasaki who's probably the most well-known uh bomb server hibakusha and um, the monument was inspired by her, but it's for all of the children that died um, in the atomic bombing. And so at that monument, we will tell the story of Sadako, why, um, you know, why her story has been so widely spread around the world. And of course, the symbolism of the paper crane. Um, and for me, I, um, I am 
pretty much unteachable when it comes to folding paper cranes. Um, I've been, you know, coming back and forth to Hiroshima for so long and I just have given up. So when I see, you know, Hiroshima receives 10 tons of paper cranes, like 10 million paper cranes per year, it's really difficult to fathom. And each one is so small and, and folded so, so um, expertly seemingly to myself. So to me, those cranes are such a powerful, powerful symbol of, um, you know, how many people in the world are praying for a world without nuclear weapons and a world, uh, a peaceful world. So that's usually the last uh, stop that we go to, to kind of end on that note. Yeah, it's, it's powerful and it's, it's actionable. That's yeah. it's something so important with sustainability and talking about peace is you give something that people can do to hope for peace, right? Mm. Like floating, writing your message, floating the lanterns, yes. uh, thinking about peace, folding an ori, ori zulu crane. It, mm. It's an action which helps us think about peace, but it also helps us feel like we're doing something proactive. Mm -hmm. And psychologically, that's really important because if you don't give people any actionable way to deal with their grief, mm -hmm it's not good and yeah and they won't feel good about it right and mm -hmm. you know you you know you live in Hiroshima don't you see people sometimes after they visit the museum walking mm -hmm. around Hiroshima and they're traumatized right because it's powerful and it's mm -hmm. so sad that how could humans do that to other innocent humans so many mm -hmm. women and children and students died it wasn't mm -hmm. just a military target. There were military, mm -hmm. um, but it's it's traumatizing, right? And the museum is done so beautifully and tells so many great stories. Uh, it's just been redone, just opened recently. Um, really worth visiting and taking in all those wonderful stories. They also, inside the museum, have Sadako's shoes and her bag and tell I think the Sadako exhibit is one of the most popular because people have heard the story before it's an easy story to relay when you go back and talk about your trip to Hiroshima right yes yes yeah so it's yeah. connecting the stories of people like you do at the children's monument and how her friends were activists in getting that monument up after mm -hmm. she died and mm -hmm. the idea of folding cranes um, to get well but she started giving her cranes away because she realized she wasn't getting well and she wanted to hope for others to get well this is all mm -hmm. really powerful parts of her story right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so at the top of the children's monument you can see a figure holding a giant orizuru crane and People often say that's Sadako, right? Mm -hmm. Holding up to yeah. the sky, right? Yes. Yeah. I, you know, August 6th, sometimes you see people crying around that, you know, and, and me too. It, it gets you, right? Mm hmm. Yeah. So many children died that day. Yes. Um, let's talk for a few more minutes about the future. What, what do you see um, happening? Well, first, give us a little introduction of the farm, because we haven't heard anything about the Peace Culture Village farm. Mm. I know you guys aren't very active out there now. You're mainly focused on the tours. Mm -hmm. um, but could you introduce that to us? Yeah, of course. So um, as I said before, PCV started as an eco-village, uh, a nonprofit in Miyoshi, which is about two hours north of Hiroshima. And um, at that campus for the, the couple years I was there, um, we would have almost or, um, 350 people from around the world visiting us per year. Uh, we were doing organic farming. We were doing um, teaching English. We were um, kind of doing um, something that we're still doing now, which is creating custom programs that link the city and the countryside for groups of students and teachers that visit from abroad. So, so like, like the Oleander initiative that I described before. Um, and so, um, uh, basically the village, um, now it, we are still active there. Um, and we're still involved there, but we don't have an eco village set up. 
um, just because it was a lot of work and it wasn't sustainable economically. Um, so, you know, that's why um, we are focusing most of our efforts on the city right now, just so that we can continue to um, to run. But another reason is to really connect the city and the countryside. So um, there's, you know, we talk about uh, this more holistic view of peace culture. And I think we're in Hiroshima City, of course, you can learn about the horrors of nuclear weapons and nuclear war, hear the Hibakusha stories, which is so, um, so important. And then um, to complement that, we often take our program participants to the countryside. And so many people say that being surrounded by nature really helps them to process what they learn in Hiroshima. Um, and not only that, but talking about sustainability, talking about sustainable agriculture, sustainable community building, inner peace and meditation, these are also parts of what peace is and parts of what a peace culture is. And so um, when students and teachers come to Hiroshima from around the world, many of them want to also know what Hiroshima Prefecture has to offer in terms of peace culture education. Um, and so, you know, right now we're not doing much of that because of coronavirus, but um, hopefully once things calm down, we'll be able to um, continue to offer those sorts of programs. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Um, one thing I would love to see you guys do, because now you're doing more online stuff, mm -hmm. um, you are not limited to the Peace Park, right? Mm -hmm. So because it's online, I would love to see you guys offering online tours and including the A-bombed warehouses. Mm. in in Dambara, which are, you know, being under discussion whether to keep them or not. I would mm. love to see an online tour um, just walking through some of the other uh, ruins that are still around in Hiroshima. Um, mm. The Hiroshima's Japan Bank is one of the surviving buildings, which is so cool to walk through, right? And in the basement, you can see the old safe where they used to keep all the money and it's used as an art exhibit center. So I would love to see um, an expansion of the offer, not just centered on Peace Park, because you are free now, because it's, it's online, to offer a, a broader view of the peace connected facilities and activities in Hiroshima, I know that's huge, right? It's a it's a huge ask, but if you are looking for other ways to connect with people online and connect with a wider audience, um, there's a lot of people that have no idea that there is anything in Hiroshima outside of Peace Park, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's why uh, we started Get Hiroshima 20 years ago, right? Is is to introduce not only peace things, but restaurants and other activities to people visiting Hiroshima or residents here. But you guys are focused on peace, so a focus on peace, but kind of a wider view, if if you have a chance. Um, okay. I'm going to talk to Mayu Seto on Friday about uh, the warehouses. She's been yeah. very active with trying to preserve the A-bombed beautiful red brick warehouses. And I visited um, that site with her a few months ago before coronavirus. Mm -hmm. And so we'll be talking about that on Friday. But yeah, just, yeah. just keep it in mind. And I want to come and, and walk around Peace Park with you and, and talk to you guys and encourage you. And I really appreciate all the work you guys are doing. Thank you so much. I know it's, yeah. a, it's a big job. Yeah, it's and to thank you so much for your suggestion. I think we are always looking for ways to add more content, to expand. We are like just getting started with this yeah, online yeah. stuff. So like the app is is not even finished yet. Like our our, our online programs are also in development. Um, so I'm we're starting with Peace Park, but I think definitely we were talking earlier about you know my love of video games and then also uh, technology incorporating technology in this corona age i think eventually the goal would be um and we're actually planning to crowdfund for this soon but um is to take this ar app that we have and improve it so that maybe eventually it can be vr and that could be used during walking tours it could be used um from your home 
And then potentially like we're talking, there's lots of really cool ideas going around. So, and I think like the work that Seto Mayu and Fukuoka Nao and um, Tanaka Miho and all that group is doing to preserve the um, Hifukushi show is also so important. And so eventually incorporating um, other buildings around the city, I think is an awesome idea. And I think kind of online, there's very little that's impossible. So, um, you know, I think that's a really great idea that energizes me and hopefully we can incorporate that in the future. Good, great. And I'd love to, you know, I'm, my focus is on live streaming now. I'd mm -hmm. love to come and do a live stream as we walk around together and and have that experience at on location. I think this, oh, this is the yeah. year for talking about Hiroshima and Nagasaki when the, the eyes of the world are on mm -hmm. Hiroshima and Nagasaki this year especially. So mm -hmm. I'd love to collaborate with you guys if you're interested. Yeah. That Try sounds to do, really cool. Do some projects, do more yeah. live streaming. So absolutely. Awesome. awesome. Thank you so much. And uh, take care. We've had heavy rains in Hiroshima, so I hope you don't have to evacuate. And yeah, we've already evacuated once, so yeah. we'll see. Um, maybe. <laughs> and, and hopefully the farm's okay, not, not damaged. The farm's okay. Okay, good. At last I heard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. Thank you so much, uh, Mary, for joining us and giving us the insights about the new things you guys are doing uh, in Peace Park with the uh, rest house and online mm -hmm. and they're in person as well as virtually. And mm -hmm. I think there's so much great potential there and I really... I applaud you guys and I'm a big fan. So really, thank you so much for all you guys do. Great, thank you so much yeah. as well for this opportunity. Awesome. And thank you everybody for joining and watching and uh, commenting today. And we are live here again tomorrow morning talking with the head of the UNITAR office, Mihoko, about the work that she does with conflict resolution for the Asian region in Hiroshima. So thank you so much for joining and see you again tomorrow. Thanks everybody. Bye Mary, thank you so much. Oh, okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.